Living Ontario for providing a platform to help get the voice of the developmental services sector heard. My team and I at Seamless Care Pharmacy are just as passionate about the developmental services sector. We've dedicated the past 15 years to advocating with individ for individuals living with a developmental disability, as well as developing and implementing best practices for agencies in the sector. Today, I am overwhelmed with gratitude for our panelists and guests that have volunteered their time to help provide us with some clarity. Our two main panelists are Dr. Falfer, COVID-19 lead and emergency physician at William Osler Health System, and Dr. Moga, staff physician in the critical care unit at SickKids Hospital, who's been involved in the ICU preparations for COVID-19. As a pharmacist, I usually look at things from the clinical lens, so I've also invited two moderators who are active advocates for the developmental sector to help provide a holistic view for our audience today. James Gennaro is the Director of Community Engagement and Policy at Community Living Ontario, and Cheryl Puran, a human rights, labour and employment lawyer whose practice is dedicated to supporting not-for-profit and charitable organisations in the DS sector. Welcome everyone. So over the past few weeks, we've all experienced a roller coaster of emotions. We've been constantly bombarded with information. Some of us felt fear, confusion, anger. The reality of the situation right now is that things are happening very quickly and therefore information is changing and evolving just as fast. Some of us are feeling lost and are unsure of what to believe and who to believe and maybe even having a hard time seeing the big picture. And I just want everyone out there to know that if you're feeling this way, you're not alone. One of the biggest issues and pain points in the sector right now is the shortage of personal protective equipment. Masks, gloves, gowns. Frontline staff are in a position where they're taking care of some of the most vulnerable populations and they're worried about getting sick themselves as well as infecting their high-risk individuals. I know that agencies like Community Living Toronto and Community Living Ontario are having frequent discussions at the stakeholder collaboration tables with the, dep the deputy minister, but the reality is that this is a global shortage. So people have been looking for a way to manage the shortage of supplies the best they can. There are now instructions on the web of how you can sew your own mask at home. People are putting a scarf over their face. They're asking, can masks be reused? How long are they good for? How can they be infected? Pharmacies around the country are even using plastic shower curtains as a protective barrier at their counters. So frontline healthcare providers are now, around the world are now in a position where they're having to rephrase the question. Instead of asking, how can we get more personal protective equipment? They're asking, how can we protect ourselves and our most vulnerable in the absence of personal protective equipment? So for Dr. Falfer and Dr. Moga, I'm hoping you can start us off with an intro on your experiences from the front lines, possibly help us clear some of the terminology that's going around COVID-19 versus SARS-CoV-2 and the new hashtag flatten the curve, as well as your opinion on best strategies for frontline staff to conserve the available personal protective equipment supply while also doing their best to stay safe and protected at all times in caring for the people they support. Dr. Falfer, we'll start with you. Thanks, Marwa. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for having me today. Uh, and uh, I want to most importantly thank all of you in the audience. Uh, as someone who works in the hospital sector, uh, I probably have a complete underappreciation for all the hard work that happens uh, in the community, taking care of uh, complex patients uh, and clients, uh, and uh, all the hard work that goes into preventing these patients from ending up in our acute care system. And so, First of all, thank you uh, to everyone on the phone for all the great work you do, especially in a time right now uh, where we are being asked to stay home, minimize non-essential work. Uh, everything you do is essential and it's, it's, it's hard, I'm sure, on all of you as you leave your families every day to do the work that you're doing, uh, wondering uh, about how, uh, how that's gonna affect your, your exposure to, the, to this uh, virus and how is that gonna affect your families. Um, I want to start by saying, uh, just as all of you have questions, uh, even those of us who work in the acute care center, work in the, in, in, in the medical side of healthcare, acute medical side of healthcare, we have a lot of questions and there are a lot of unknowns. And so as this evolves, um, things and, and ideas that you're going to hear, thoughts about what the appropriate treatments are, 
these things are all going to change. So this is an evolving process. And so what we discussed today, I hope we can uh, focus on trying to uh, simplify the language. And if you have any questions or you find that my terminology is perhaps a little too technical, please let me know. I'll try my best to try to keep things as simple as possible. Um, and recognizing that there's a lot of non-clinical people in, in the audience today. And that I also want to share with you that the anxiety you're feeling, I'm feeling right now as a frontline uh, front emergency physician uh, about how the next few months in Canada uh, are, and especially in Ontario and the GTA are going to unfold as we, uh, as we face this pandemic. Um, I wanted to start off by giving a sort of a state of the union as to uh, what is our situation here in Canada and specifically in Ontario? Um, as of yesterday, uh, Ontario Health, the, the, the super agency for all healthcare, uh, reported that there has been a total of four, uh, sorry, 503 uh, confirmed cases uh, of uh, COVID-19 uh, or coronavirus. And uh, of those, there has been six deaths to date. Uh, and what's most important is that there's actually 8,400 swabs that are uh, awaiting uh, testing and uh, results are pending. And so over the next few days, we may see that number go up. Now, how does that compare? How do we compare to other communities? I mean, I know a lot of right now in the news in North America regarding what's happening in North York, uh, New York City, uh, New York State, uh, Washington State, and California uh, is quite concerning. and uh, Oh, in terms of order of magnitude, we're nowhere near there. Uh, we've instituted uh, social distancing and a lot of policies in the last few days and in the last week to try to uh, slow down the spread. And so um, what I want to say is that we still have a chance to sort of mitigate and to, to reduce uh, some of this, uh, some of the high numbers that we're seeing in some of community communities. Uh, near us uh, or in New York City, California, et cetera. So first of all, um, in terms of the terminology, uh, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 and are the same thing. And so both of those are just a way of describing the strain of coronavirus that's currently causing the pandemic. What is coronavirus? Coronavirus is a family of a number of viruses that all are similar. Think of it as like a category of, uh, of um, vegetables. Uh, you know, you have your root vegetables and think of Corona as that, a family of, of a bunch of viruses. And, um, and in the, among those viruses are many coronaviruses, which all of you in the audience have been affected by before in, the ter in terms of the, the common cold. So any of us have been exposed to a number of coronaviruses over our lifetime, uh, most of which produce symptoms similar to a common cold. Uh, what's different about this virus is that none of us have been exposed to it. So none of us have any immunity to the current COVID-19 strain that is uh, you know, rapidly progressing throughout the world. Uh, and so not having immunity makes us all susceptible uh, to developing symptoms. Now, those of us who do get COVID-19, there's a wide range of ways in which this presents. So some people will not have any symptoms uh, and in fact can continue to be, uh, can, can cause spread, although less so. Um, some of us might just have mild symptoms similar to a common cold and be able to fight it off. Some of us may have more symptoms that uh, are similar to a, a pneumonia, so fatigue, difficulty breathing. And then what's really concerning and the reason why there is so much, uh, uh, you know, around the world, there is so, uh, such fear and then all, uh, also uh, serious uh, interventions happening like closing down borders, closing down flights, closing down non-essential work here in Ontario uh, is because about 20% of patients who get the coronavirus, uh, this new strain COVID-19, will end up requiring ICU level care. Uh, and so that means intensive care unit level care, which is the highest level of acute care you can get in the hospital, uh, which often means requiring lots of oxygen uh, and to the point of uh, requiring often uh, being connected to a breathing machine or a ventilator. Now, why is that important? Well, in Ontario, in a good winter, 
with where we deal with the regular seasonal flu and we have increases in our utilization in the emergency departments, our ICUs are at 100% capacity already. And so we have very little uh, ability to increase our capacity in a short period of time. And that's not to do with just the number of ICU ventilators, the equipment, but also to do with the nursing staff, the doctors and the hospital space that's required for this high level of care. And so it's multifactorial and it's, a, you know, for those of you who follow politics and uh, the last couple of provincial elections, this has been a huge hot button issue. The, the, the hashtag hallway medicine describes the fact that at the best of times and during the winter surge season, the winter flu season, our uh, healthcare system in the hospital side is at 100% capacity. In fact, many hospitals, especially in the GTA, um, including the two hospital sites that my organization are frequently well above 100% capacity. And that's what leads to hallway medicine. So when you introduce a new uh, virus that is causing a lot of people to require ICU level of care, uh, there's a concern that we don't really have any room to go above the 100% that we're already at. And that is a very big concern. And, it, and we're seeing that in New York City right now in California. These are rich, rich, uh, you know, uh, parts of, of, of the U.S. where they have big, beautiful hospitals. And even there with a lot of capacity, they are starting to struggle with the issue of who, who can they keep in their ICU and who do they have to unfortunately turn away from ICU services. And so um, that's where the hashtag flatten the curve comes in. And so the main concept of flattening the curve is that while we recognize that there's, a, there's limits to how we can prevent spread and that at some point, uh, whether it's this next few months, next year in the winter, in a couple of years, all of us will be exposed to this virus at some point. Um, how that exposure leads to our symptoms will change over time as the virus mutates and changes, and no one knows how to predict that. But what we do know is that if in the next month we don't, we hadn't taken the measures that we've taken in Ontario for social distancing, closing down non-essential work, uh, avoiding uh, large gatherings, if we hadn't done that, we would be at risk of having an overwhelming number of patients get really, really sick at the same time. And so that's what flattening the curve means. If a whole bunch of people get sick right now, we don't have the space and the capacity to treat them all to the best of our abilities in modern medicine. And we will have to make tough decisions similar to what you've read about in Italy and Spain, where patients, typically elderly patients, are not being offered ICU level of care and instead being given a palliative approach. And unfortunately, as a result, uh, a lot of those patients are then dying because they're unable to to uh, to fight off the virus and and so that's really what flattening the curve means it means look we, we may not be able to completely avoid people getting this virus but as long as in the next month or two we don't have a whole bunch of people getting the virus uh, we can better manage our resources and in the meantime develop things like vaccines which will take about a year to 18 months at, be at best um, we can add capacity come up with other potential treatment protocols. And so right now, I mean, that brings me to my next point around treatment. Right now, uh, with regards to treatment, uh, there is no uh, definitive uh, uh, solution. Like many viruses, there really isn't any treatment that works. There's some, some thoughts about antiviral medications, uh, old malaria medications like chloroquine and hydrochloroquine. And then also Zithromax, Zithromycin, which is an antibiotic that's often prescribed for uh, bacterial uh, respiratory infections. Uh, but unfortunately, none of, there is no good data that any of these medications work. And so really what we're providing patients with is supportive care uh, until their body is able to fight off the infection. Similarly, um, there has uh, been some... Um, you know, discussion in the media regarding the use of Tylenol and Advil. And again, the jury is out. Um, there is no evidence that neither Tylenol nor Advil make things worse. And um, treating patients' fevers uh, helps them with uh, feel better. It helps them allow the, allows them to be more alert and and take take uh, uh, and then able to feed and drink and uh, take down fluids to keep well hydrated. 
And so treating fever is important. Um, and so uh, right now there is no definitive evidence that that any of these things, that continuing to do so like you would with any other flu or viral illness is, is a bad thing. Um, before we open it up to questions and also have my colleague, Dr. Moga, give the, the, the pediatric perspective, um, I definitely want to talk about PPE, so protective uh, equipment, personal protective equipment for, uh, for healthcare workers uh, and staff that are in direct contact with patients that they're concerned about. Um, I can tell you right off the bat that uh, the lack of PPE, as Marmo, I think, said in her intro, is an issue all across North America, whether you're at private hospitals, public hospitals, large hospitals in Toronto, small hospitals rurally, uh, big community hospitals like the one I work at. Everyone is struggling with how can we preserve PPE, make a consistent effort to do what's uh, right, uh, what, what is the appropriate um, use of PPE to, to protect staff safety. Uh, one of my big focuses in our prepar preparations over the last week is to really just concentrate on staff safety. If we cannot be safe as healthcare workers, uh, we cannot uh, do a good job treating our patients. And so staff safety has to be the priority when coming up with policies. Uh, more importantly also is that if one staff member gets it and you're in close contact with other staff and other patients and clients, you will quickly become a super spreader. And so preventing staff and healthcare workers from getting uh, uh, exposed to the virus right now is of utmost importance. And beyond patient safety, staff safety has to be the priority in order for us to provide safe patient care. And so um, what I want to just uh, reiterate is some basic facts about uh, PPE, PPE utilization in um, a respiratory uh, virus such as um, such as COVID-19. And so it is what is called a droplet uh, virus. It's spread by droplets. That means uh, a patient's nasal secretions, cough, spit, uh, sweat uh, can be transferred and cause um, uh, and, and spread the virus. And, and, and so it's really important that uh, we, re we recognize that this is a droplet virus and not an airborne virus. An airborne virus like TB or measles uh, or the previous SARS epidemic, for those of you who went through that in 2003, uh, um, means that just the virus circulating in the air, can uh, you can get infected. And so that's not the case at, uh, uh, for uh, COVID-19. So for those people that you see walking outside just regularly in public wearing a face mask, they're not doing, that face mask is not doing anything to prevent uh, uh, the spread of the virus. Uh, if they are, have a cough and they're in close contact with people, that's a different story. But just walking around with a face mask will not do anything to prevent you uh, from getting the virus. And it's really important, just like with medications, that when we talk about PPE, we talk about the risks and the benefits of uh, wearing PPE. So one of the risks of wearing a mask all day uh, through your day-to-day -day activities is that it gets you itchy. Uh, and you're going to start touching your face more. And so you're more likely to actually put, give yourself the virus, not to mention if the face mask has been on for a while and there is droplets that you've been exposed to, those droplets are just sitting on your face much longer. And so more than face masks and gowns, uh, as um, people who are doing their day-to-day -day activities, when you're not in direct close contact with uh, patients or clients who may be uh, exposed to the virus or may have the virus, when you're just doing your day-to-day -day office work uh, outside, the two most important things that you can do to prevent the virus are one or three, let's say three things. One, wash your hands frequently, regular soap and water, don't need any fancy hand sanitizer, regular soap and water for 20 to 30 seconds. Um, don't touch your face. Uh, you know, as someone who has uh, eczema, I, it's been a real eye-opener to try to keep track of how often I touch my face. Uh, and we all do. And so it, make, it a, make it a conscious activity in your day-to-day -day, uh, life to start giving yourself a little reminder every time you find yourself touching your face. Maybe even have someone who, who's around you a lot to, to give you that reminder every time you touch your face. Because touching your eyes, touching your mouth and nose with dirty hands with where you may have droplets of the virus on your hands will increase the chance uh, of infection for you. 
Uh, similarly, cough etiquette is very important. Coughing into your sleeve as opposed to using your hand to cough um, is, is very important. Um, and then, um, and then social distancing, of course, right? Limiting big gatherings, even when you're with your family at home as much as possible, keeping a distance of six feet, uh, which is the distance that if you do sneeze or cough, your droplets in your nose and mouth can travel. Uh, Marwa, do you think it's worth going into, uh, should I go into about what to do about close contact with patients and then also clients that you may be worried may have the disease, what to do? Is that fair? Uh yeah, okay. yeah, that's definitely a lot of the questions that are coming through. So if you have time to cover that, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, so, so yeah, I'll do that right now then. Okay, so what do you do uh, about uh, personal protective equipment with a patient who has a fever, or sorry, patient, I'm used to saying patient, uh, uh, well, I'll try to use the word client as well, uh, that you think may have uh, COVID-19? So let's first cover what to do about your personal protective equipment, and then we'll cover what to do uh, for the patient. So if you're worried that a, a, the client that you're uh, working with, um, unless you're doing a procedure uh, that is called an aerosolized generating procedure. So in the emergency department, that means putting some, uh, that really only means one thing, which is putting a tube in, in someone's lungs to help them breathe or so putting them on a, a life support. Basically, everything else you do will not be an aerosolized generate aerosol generating procedure. And so what you need to do is the following three things if you're in close contact with patients um, is gloves if uh, you uh, yeah gloves that you would use for the close contact portion of, of of your care so if you're visiting a client in home for instance maintaining social distance even in the home not touching things around the house uh is important and if you know talking to the patient if it or client if it's possible keeping a big distance and then minimizing the close contact to when you really have to do something. So I'm just trying to think of things that may that may involve, like changing a dressing, doing bathing, um, uh, personal care, feeding a client, um, uh, checking on a wound, uh, helping a patient from bed to chair, chair to wheelchair, you know, helping a person walk. Whatever those close contact moments are, for those moments, the most essential two things are just a regular surgical mask and gloves. Um, gloves should be changed after, uh, should be single use. So gloves should be single use um, and then wash your hands. Masks can be worn uh, for uh, the duration of a shift uh, so long as they're not being soiled. So if a patient coughs in your face, obviously change the mask. Uh, but if, uh, if they're not being soiled, you can continue to wear the mask for the same day. There's a lot of questions about N95 masks and what are their, um, uh, what is the ut utility of an N95 mask over a surgical mask? And I, you know, just looking out my window right now at home, yeah, you know, I've seen two people walking around the street with an N95 mask. And this is absolutely dangerous for us all and is going to lead to a big shortage where they're needed the most. So even in the emergency department, 99% of the time when we're doing direct close patient, patient contact where we're not putting a patient on a ventilator, a surgical mask, that's your regular mask, is sufficient. Even a clean scarf is sufficient so long as you wash it after, after your day is over. Uh, and so really, it doesn't need to be anything fancy. So when I say a mask, I mean just something that's co comfortable and is covering your nose and mouth. Um, it does not need to be a tight seal. In fact, a lot of the patient, people who are walking around with N95s are actually wearing N95s that are not meant for their particular face. And so they're, they're, they're completely useless and completely unnecessary. And are actually much more un, uncomfortable than a, um, a regular surgical mask. So I bet you that they're all itching themselves a lot more with the N95 mask on. So if there's one or two things that you remember from this talk, I know we've covered a lot already, uh, is uh, N95 masks for the vast majority of what you're going to be doing. I mean, I can't speak for everything that you do with your clients, but you know, close contact, wound care, bathing, uh, feeding a patient, a client. Uh, for none of that, unless you're doing incredibly invasive procedures like deep suctioning of a, a client's tracheostomy, even then, uh, I mean, that may be the one area where an N95 would be useful. 
uh, but even then that's probably a surgical mask will do. Along with a surgical mask, uh, I would also recommend goggles to protect your eyes um, uh, from, uh, from direct contact with droplets. Uh, those goggles should be washed after each or wiped and clean after each client. Uh, one of the things to remember, which I mentioned before, is that when, in addition to the, the two biggest risks to personal uh, PPE or personal protective equipment is one, not wearing the appropriate level of PPE, and two, the, the taking off procedure. So the majority of contamination that happens in the hospital setting especially is not so much uh, uh, the inappropriate appropriate wearing is but the taking off procedure as we we often don't focus on that. Public Health Ontario has some great videos on donning and doffing. If you just YouTube doffing person PPE so D-O-F-F-I-N-G there's some great videos on how to appropriately take off uh, the PPE. So again with direct close personal contact whether it's surgical mask, goggles, gloves and then some sort of gown. The gown does not have to be impervious or waterproof just it's an extra cover over your regular clothes of some sort that you're going to take off after direct patient contact and not use again. Um, again, it, there's nothing fancy about it. It's just literally protecting the droplets from going on your clothes. If you're unable to have a gown, uh, you know, I, I would hope that most people in today's setting when they go home from work are immediately taking off their clothes, putting them in the laundry, showering, um, and then take, you know, showering with soap and then, and then, and then, and then putting on a fresh set of clothes. And so, uh, again, from a daily perspective, daily activity, please don't wear masks. You're probably doing yourself more harm and you're definitely doing society more harm by uh, uh, wasting uh, what is unfortunately a scarce resource at the moment all across North America. Uh, there is a lot of work in place to try to uh, increase the manufacturing of PPE by large companies and other companies that are getting involved. And, and you know, they, we're looking at two to three weeks before we have a better idea of what the what the, um, uh, what the supply chain will be like. But I can tell you that every single hospital in Ontario is sweating on how they're gonna get through the next couple of weeks right now. And so in order for us all to get through this, we all need to be consistent in our approach so that uh, we use the uh, PPE appropriately, we protect ourselves uh, uh, appropriately with the right uh, strategies, and then we also minimize harm to our communities by by uh, hoarding and under you know and over utilizing equipment and so every one of you has staff uh, uh, who's going to say uh, I don't care what the guidelines are I'm wearing an N95 mask and I think that requires uh, difficult and courageous discussions and also education that you're probably doing yourself more harm by over uh, over uh, uh, dressing I mean we have a lot of physicians who we just had a very difficult conversation two days ago uh, who were asking for hoods and all sorts of hazmat suits similar to the you know the two three videos everyone keeps seeing on replay uh, from China um, there's a lot of misinformation out there and frankly hazmat suits are probably dangerous for anyone wearing those because the taking off part is so difficult that they're going to contaminate themselves when they take them off and so again think of PPE like a medication a drug that you or your family members would when you decide to take. There's both benefits and risks, and we can't underestimate the risks of putting stuff on and then not and then ignoring simple things that are actually more effective, like good hand washing, um, uh, coughing etiquette, social distancing, going home, taking off your clothes, and showering immediately. Um, and so uh, I think we've covered a lot in this short time already. Uh, I'm trying to think. Why don't we Why don't we turn it to Dr. Movoga to give us the pediatric perspective, uh, and um, and then and then take it from there for questions. Does that sound good, Marwa? Yeah, that sounds great. I just want you to um, just clear for the audience just the PPEs the, and the um, uh, the procedures that you were talking about, those are for the homes only if you suspect somebody has symptoms or are you saying that staff should be doing this all the time with everybody? Because just like PPEs and I like how you had that metaphor, like drugs only use them and make sure that, you know, the risks and benefits, are we only using them if we need them as well in order to be able to conserve? Uh, uh, that's a great question. That's actually a very difficult question. And that reminds me, I forgot to talk about when to, when to, access help for your clients who you think have uh, symptoms. 
And so if your clients are for the, the have not been exposed to someone directly close by, and I'm assuming most of the clients that uh, the, 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 the attendees online are taking care of aren't necessarily uh, out, out and about in large groups. But if, they, if there's no known exposure and they do not have a fever or any upper respiratory tract infections, cold, runny nose, headache, uh, sneezing, or GI symptoms, so severe di diarrhea, um, then I would just stick to your regular routine of good hand hygiene, gloves. You can continue to wear a mask uh, as an extra precaution, like, but I, I, I would say it would be the same mask you're wearing all day. Um, if, you, if you're concerned about, and a lot of people are concerned about the spread from asymptomatic carriers, if, you're pay, if your client is homebound, uh, you're very clear on what their uh, interactions are with people other than yourself and, and, and they're limited, their chance of acquiring this virus is incredibly, incredibly low. And so again, just the simple things like hand, hand hygiene, cough etiquette uh, is what I would leave it at. Um, Marwa, you'd asked me to also talk about when should you get help? Um, so basically this will be, this is uh, the key here is that in terms of screening, there is a huge limitation on who gets screened now because we just simply in Ontario don't have the resources to screen everyone. So if you're just worried about getting someone screened to be like, ah, do they have COVID or not? The only people who are going to actually get a swab, so make it worth your while to take them to a assessment center in the GTA or a hospital, the only, and this, this is posted everywhere on Public Health Ontario, Public Health Toronto, the only people who are going to get a swab are people who have flu-like symptoms, so cough, runny nose, sneezing, fever, um, uh, GI symptoms, and are over the age of 60, are on uh, medications or have a disease that affects their commun uh, immune system, so HIV, chemotherapy for cancer, uh, dialysis patients, uh, patients who have had transplants or on medications that suppress their immune system, um, or healthcare workers. Those are real, or or a very close contact. So if you have a roommate who tested positive, so those are the people who will actually get a swab. So if someone has mild symptoms and you just want to know, do they have this or not, then they have to meet that criteria. Um, and and you know the, these criteria are the same all across Ontario. And so to take someone out of the home just to get a swab, uh, if it, it they really have know what the criteria are before you make that decision. If you think someone has COVID-19 because they have some of the symptoms and they're having trouble breathing, they're unable to drink fluids, they're unable to keep fluid down, or you know they're vomiting nonstop, uh, and especially if they are having trouble breathing, and this is something that you just look at them and they're saying, you know, I'm, or they look like they're struggling to breathe, then these are absolutely people who you should call 911 for, or bring them to the ER. Absolutely. So, like I said before, 20% uh, approximately of people who get COVID-19 will get into significant respiratory issues and may require oxygen, supplemental oxygen, until they get better. And so, the only way to be sure is to send them to the ER. And, and you know, it's tough uh, uh, for the community workers out there because I know we have this habit uh, of hammering home, avoid the ER, avoid the ER, avoid the ER. Uh, and unfortunately, that can be a, sometimes a dangerous message. And so if you think your patient has COVID-19 based on their symptoms and they have trouble breathing, you're worried about their breathing, you're worried that they're not keeping any fluids down, that they need an IV, please do not hesitate. Do not worry about our ERs being busy. That's for us to figure out. Uh, and make, we need to make sure that everyone who needs care gets it. And so please do not do not hesitate to arrange for your patient or client to be seen in the ER if they're if you're worried about those two things. Thank you I so think, much, Dr. Fowler. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we'll move on to uh, Dr. Moga now with uh, some of her comments. Great. Thanks, everyone. I'll uh, echo first the, uh, you know, thanks for letting me participate in this forum and also thinking, thanking everyone who's um, kind of online. We know that, you know, we all think that sometimes healthcare workers are the unsung heroes, but 
even today, I, I think there's a lot of um, appreciation for what the acute care people are doing, but there's less appreciation for what you all are doing on a daily basis to help us prevent all of these things that we've been hearing about uh, throughout the world. So beyond just the pediatric perspective, I wanna also um, provide a perspective um, from critical care, from intensive care medicine. Uh, we're part of um, the interdivisional uh, critical care medicine department at the University of Toronto, which basically encompasses a almost every ICU within the GTA. And our reach is international um, because we were at the forefront of the first SARS-CoV in 2003. We have developed an international network where we don't just learn from what happens here. We're actively learning and engaging with colleagues in pretty much every country throughout the world to gather data and information from the front line on a daily basis. Um, so from an ICU perspective, this is something that we continue to prepare for, but I think more importantly, we recognize that if we help the community um, prepare as well, we can prevent these spikes in intensive care need that everyone sees from Italy and now from Spain and that we're, we were seeing in China. So first I'll cover from the pediatric perspective, universally, this is not a severe disease in pediatric patients. There have been a very, very small number of deaths of pediatric patients throughout the world. Even in Italy, there have been two confirmed deaths of pediatric patients who have been infected with um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And those children had multiple underlying comorbidities. They would have died if they'd gotten infected with the flu or any other variety of respiratory illnesses. So in general, we see children almost as vectors, as ways that this transmits and spreads to adults and to, in particular, older adults who are at risk. I think a couple things I wanted to focus on, uh, first of all, were potentially some resources, some very reliable resources that people can go to. Um, we already heard about the Public Health Ontario and the Toronto Public Health kind of websites. A couple other places that I would point people to that we actually go to to get information. There's a great website out of Johns Hopkins University. They have a um, COVID dashboard essentially in which they track real time as much as possible the spread of the disease throughout the world. Um, so if you just Google COVID Johns Hopkins University, you'll be able to come up to this dashboard and it's available to anyone. Another great place for um, resources for practical information is the WHO, so the World Health Organization. They'll have recommendations about PPE and so on and so forth. And just to reiterate, currently the WHO recommendation for wearing a mask in particular is only for high-risk procedures and for high-risk interactions. So that's defined by, do you have a, a suspicion that the patient that you're caring for actually is infected with, with uh, COVID. And then as well, what kind of procedure are you doing? Um, we heard about these aerosolized generating procedures. They are kind of few and far between in addition to things that we would do in the ICU and in the, uh, and in the ER, other aerosolized generating medical procedures will be things like open airway suctioning, um, sputum induction, tracheostomy care, and things like that. It does not include things such as basic care of a patient, catheter insertions, or anything like that. Those are the recommendations that we're currently following at SickKids. We only are wearing N95 masks for suspected or confirmed patients who have the um, SARS-CoV-2 virus, and we're doing aerosolized generating procedures. For all routine care, we are just wearing a surgical mask and then gown and gloves. Um, in addition, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about and reinforce these kind of top five ways from a very practical perspective that we can kind of halt the progression of this virus. And I think they really do bear everyone committing these to memory because um, they are easy to understand but difficult to enact. So that includes this social distancing, being very, very fastidious about your hand washing. Anytime you touch any surface, 
that you think could be infected or that you don't know what's on that surface, you should wash your hands. You should also clean surfaces more frequently than you do otherwise. This would be important when you're going to visit clients in their home. In addition, that cough etiquette and making sure that you don't touch your face. This is something that has come out over and over and over again when we've talked to our colleagues in Italy, the UK, Spain, so the places that have been very hard hit. But then as well, we've really been interested in learning from people where they have been able to stem the, stem the tide and what we call flatten that curve, which has been places like Singapore, Australia, and other places. Um, they say that all of these other fancy things that we're talking about are further down the road that hopefully if you do all of these other simple five things first, you can prevent the need for all of these um, ICU level care admissions and then the thoughts of potentially rationing healthcare and so on and so forth. Um, in addition, I, I'd like to stress as well that we, everyone here is feeling the crunch of the PPE. Um, there is no place that is hoarding it that I know of. Um, and so the earlier that you rationalize the use of it, we, we are just at the beginning. Um, if you look at the course of this disease, the number of cases um, in Ontario and in Canada continues to increase per day. And so we are at where the UK and other places in Europe probably were three weeks ago. So if we're already concerned about rationing and about, limit, about uh, limitations of PPE now, it's going to get worse before it gets better. So we need to be very stringent and cautious about this as we continue to go forward and fall back on what are these other methods, the distancing, the hand washing, the cleaning of surfaces, not touching your face, and that cough etiquette so that we don't run into these problems in, in a significant degree going forward. Um, I wanted to keep my comments brief because I know there's a lot of people online and I see there's about 15 minutes left, so I'd like to be able to get to, to some questions. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Moga. Um, James, uh, do you want to get to your questions? We do have about a little less than 15 minutes. Sure. Uh, James Gennaro here from Community Living Toronto. Thank you, Marwa. Uh, right off the bat, I just want to thank um, our two uh, frontline medical presenters here. We really, really appreciate on behalf of everyone on the call and really all of Canada, we really appreciate your service on the front line and fighting this battle. Uh, and I wanted to add to, to the list of thanks as well, um, the hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands at least of developmental services workers who are out there in the community every day on the front lines in group homes in residential care settings uh, keeping some very vulnerable people safe that's people with dis developmental disabilities uh, continuing to work through the crisis declared uh, or on that list of essential services the province put out yesterday uh, and continuing to do amazing work um, in the community. Uh, I had some comments which I was going to deliver. I'm not going to because I think the questions from um, the, um, the participants are more uh, critical than what I was going to say beyond thanking. Uh, I think, our, um, sorry James, I, I will stop you, but actually I wouldn't mind hearing your comments. Okay, um, sure. Yeah, because sure. the, the two presenters already covered quite a bit of the questions uh, that I'd sent. Sure, okay, you. great. Thank you. Great. So then, thanks, Marla. So I'll say then that uh, in developmental services, we're, we're a sector that supports uh, kids and adults with uh, developmental uh, disabilities. Uh, a lot of the clientele that we support tend to also have uh, various other um, comorbidities and other conditions, underlying conditions like diabetes, hepatitis, um, and other things that kind of make them more vulnerable. So we've, we take, we, Community Live in Toronto took the step um, not that long ago now uh, to shut down what we call our day programs, which is to say our programming uh, out in the community for people that we support. So employment training, uh, social activities, choir, art classes, that kind of thing, uh, and keeping in mind with guidance on social distancing. Uh, more and more of the sector has been doing the same. Um, and we're, we're aligning on that front and now with, ur with more urgency with the requirements coming uh, from government. Um, and our, our work really to date has been aligning across the sector on a few key things. Uh, access to PPE, of course, is a big one, which we've heard already. Um, we, for Community Living Toronto specifically, we've, we've taken these measures of, of uh, making sure we have as much stock as we can, but rationing it uh, as much as we can as well. Uh, so, for example, we've put out a small number of kits 
of complete PPE in, in our homes uh, for immediate use in a situation where it's necessary with provisions to distribute more PPE as necessary uh, when, when medical guidance suggests that. Uh, we're in constant contact with government and uh, public health, uh, with provincial government, the feds, and Toronto Public Health on escalating steps as necessary given the, the vulnerability of our population. Um, and the most important thing that kind of happened in the last couple of days is that the, the declaration from the province that these services will continue. So um, based on the closure announced yesterday. So this is really, really critical. But let's just say a lot of vulnerable people out there who depend on the services that our workers provide and those services won't be interrupted. Um, but we, as I said, we have taken extraordinary measures um, and access to PPE, protecting our staff and closure of basically um, almost anything that isn't a residential setting where people um, require support from our staff. Um, there are, of course, the consistent issues that, that you know, we've all heard about. As I mentioned, we've all heard about access to PPE as one. Uh, we're getting more and more guidance from government and public health uh, related specifically to our population. Uh, and we're getting better and better as a sector at disseminating that information out across our sector as well, because we are in every province, uh, pardon me, in every community across the province. So um, the, the communication remains an issue, of course, um, but we're, we think we're getting better and certainly responding as, as uh, things unfold. Uh, that's all I had to say. Uh, so I'll turn, Marwa, if you're okay, I'll turn to a question now. Does that work for you? Go ahead, yeah. Yeah, great. So um, I think something that we're all feeling is that there's, there's we're inundated with information uh, all the time. Uh, some of it is kind of sketchy and some of it is reliable. Uh, so my question to our two presenters is, uh, is where, where do you think a lay person should go for the most up-to-date and accurate information. Recognizing you mentioned John Hopkins and WHO, uh, also recognizing that some of the, that a lot of the material coming out of those sources is fairly technical, um, but for lay people who don't have any sort of background in this, where would you recommend they turn for, uh, for great information? So I'll give this question to Dr. Moga so she can have a little bit more time to speak and then just keep in mind, we wanna hear from Cheryl Puran. Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. So actually, um, Believe it or not, the, the Johns Hopkins site doesn't give you information outside of numbers, but to give you perspective on how easy that is to use and comprehend, my 80-year-old mother now joins the site daily. Um, and so it is easy for a, lay, for a lay person to look at. I would say that the WHO um, does provide information at a variety of levels um, for people that are medical and non-medical. Um, in addition, I, I would say Public Health Ontario um, and Public Health Toronto would be a couple other sites um, that should provide high quality kind of information that's been looked at um, and deemed to at least be um, something that, that, that's, that people should be looking at instead of just going and Googling COVID-19 and seeing what comes up. Um, the CDC as well, the Center for Disease Control, they have a site that is very um, friendly to lay people as well. So th those would be my recommendations in general. Thank you so much, Dr. Moga. Cheryl, uh, do you, uh, if you'd like to come on and share some comments or questions that you'd have to the doctors? Yeah, thank you very much, Marwa. Um, so what uh, I would absolutely echo what you and James have said in terms of our um, appreciation and thanks to healthcare providers, our panelists today, and, uh, and very importantly, the developmental services workers here in Ontario who are continuing to go to work every day to support uh, our really our most vulnerable people here in the province of Ontario. Um, what you've shared today uh, to our panelists it has been extremely helpful. Um, when we're looking at what's going on in the province, you know, we're supporting a lot of agencies in, in dealing with the numerous legal issues that come up um, when it comes to uh, COVID-19, whether it's the new leaves of absence that have been created by the government, um, whether it's the new uh, orders that have been put in place in terms of what is an essential service. Um, you know, we're very pleased to see that developmental services was included in the list in the list of essential services. Um, but at this point, we really don't know what 
that means other than, yes, we can continue to operate, which I think all of us assumed would be the case because there was really just no way that we could shut down. So, um, yes, we're allowed to continue to operate, but what kind of special powers, authorities, um, and supports are going to be put in place for some of these essential uh, services? Um, the declaration that we received yesterday doesn't give us the types of support that you would otherwise receive as a healthcare provider, for instance, in the DS sector. Um, and so I think that's what we need to be continuing to advocate for. Um, yesterday, long-term care homes were granted special measures, a special order was issued to allow long-term care homes to have special rights for staffing um, and, you know, a avoiding certain restrictions under collective agreements, uh, special provisions around the support that long-term care homes and their workers will provide. We are in such a very similar situation to long-term care homes here in the DS sector, and yet we haven't been granted a similar order. Um, so, so that brings me to my question for um, our panelists today, and that really is around at what point um, would you be recommending that a worker in the developmental services sector stay home? Um, because there's a bunch of new leads that have been created, um, and some of them relate to um, situations where they might have to provide care or support to a family member who has um, a COVID-19 related disability, um, and that might include situations where a person in a household has a pre-existing condition that makes them more vulnerable. Are you recommending that healthcare workers or developmental services workers in those types of scenarios stop working uh, because they could bring home COVID-19 into their home and thereby put their family members at risk? Or wh what are your recommendations around when a person should stay home because of either their own health, um, their own pre-existing condition, or the pre-existing conditions of a household member. Thank you, Cheryl. That was uh, really well said. Thank you. I think, yeah, the message, what everybody's looking for, a lot of questions are coming through. When should I stay home if I'm an essential service uh, worker? And it, unless, you know, uh, keeping in mind, do I have symptoms or not? Am I an essential service or not? Or do I have family members at home that can be at risk or not? So people just want a very clear message of when they can say, okay, I'm gonna stay home even though I'm an essential service. Either doctors. Yeah, so that's a really tough question. Uh, I think uh, your organizations will be giving you guidance. And if they're not, um, obviously you have symptoms, you're staying home. Um, if you've had a direct exposure as a healthcare worker, you would qualify for screening. And so uh, staying home in that scenario is absolutely vital. If you've had a direct exposure with someone with COVID-19 that where you didn't use proper PPE because you didn't know, um, and then going through the screening process with public health through one of our screening assessment centers is vital. Uh, the typical recommendation is to wait 14 days at that point of self-isolation. Um, how you isolate at home is a challenge if you have to provide care for, for a loved one uh, or that you're concerned that, it, that, that you may bring something home and, and, and put your vulnerable loved one in a, in a difficult situation where they catch COVID. Uh, there is no easy answer to that. Uh, and so I really think that means having a conversation with your boss uh, regarding the risks and I, I don't think there's any blanket answer to that. I think that's a very much an individual situation if you're an essential worker, but have a loved one at home who requires your care and is also vulnerable to COVID-19, right? So if someone requires care, but isn't vulnerable, so they, they're physically, they're not immunocompromised, but they require care, like say children, for instance, that's a totally different scenario than someone who is both vulnerable and requires direct care, like say an elderly person. Ooh, uh, yeah, I, I think that our question is really about even situations where they don't even need care, but they are just vulnerable, right? So if well, you've got... Then the and if isolation is impossible, then I think you have no choice but, but to, to talk to your boss about staying home, right? If, if self-isolation is not home. possible, right? If self-isolation is not possible, right? Because mm -hmm. of the, the home situation and, you know, you don't have a separate bedroom or, you know, there's many mm -hmm. factors at play there. Yeah, because, because and, and so what you're saying is that when you've got household members living together, 
in your opinion, is it is it almost inevitable that if people are living together in the same home and one is positive for COVID-19, that the others in the home will get it? Uh, I don't I don't think so. I mean, I think we're finding that with droplet, uh, like this droplet disease, it requires quite a bit of close contact. So what a lot of physicians and nurses are doing who are in the front lines in the emergency department who know that, hey, look, we're, we're, we have a high chance of being exposed. They're making arrangements in the home when possible to have a separate bedroom, have a COVID washroom, uh, not be involved too much in the kitchen, right? Those are the high traffic areas, right? If you have a, a couch where everyone sits and watch TV, well, maybe you're going to have to grab a chair and sit separately. If you know there's two washrooms, if Excellent. you're like, have two washrooms, separate the washrooms. Uh, if you're the one involved in p- preparation of meals, you might want to give someone else that duty for the for the next little while so that you're minimizing touching of kitchen appliances, fridge, et cetera. Thank you. Um, I just want to, I noticed we have about two minutes left and the webinar is going to cut us exactly at 12 uh, p.m. So I want to take a moment just to thank all our panelists. Thank you everybody for listening in uh, today. There's been an overwhelming amount of questions and we've tried to cover as much as possible to what relates to the topics we're talking about today, but um, there's still so much to be discussed. We are going to consider doing some follow-up webinars. You're also going to be getting a recording of this webinar, so please feel free to share it with your friends and with anyone that you feel would benefit. So once again, I do want to thank everyone for taking the time to tune in today. I want to thank our panelists and guests for volunteering their time to help provide us with some answers and clarity. And I want to thank all the frontline workers and essential services workers that are now getting the recognition they deserve for being the backbone of our society. I want to end, and this kind of reflects what Cheryl was saying, I do want to end by stressing how important it is to be advocating for what you believe in right now. Times like these are when the gaps in our system are most apparent, and it is also the time when change can happen fast. So while you are participating in physical distancing, please find ways to raise awareness for the developmental sector or whatever else you might feel the urge to fight for right now. This is the time to demand change and the time where we have the opportunity to come together and push for change and make sure it sticks so that we are never again in the same position we are in today. So thank you everyone uh, uh, with us today and I hope you guys have a great rest of your day.